уважаемые казахстанцы, торжественно клянусь верно служить народу нашей многонациональной республики, строго следовать Конституции Республики Казахстан, гарантировать права и свободы граждан, добросовестно выполнять возложенные на меня высокие обязанности президента Республики Казахстан. Communism fell in most countries via some sort of revolt starting from either something stupid or from something relatively minor compared to the horrors of the regime itself. In Albania, the fall of communism started with a power outage in a student campus. Power outages were a common feature in communist Albania and remained so over a decade after the fall of communism. But that particular outage in that particular moment, right on the cusp of the winter exam session, turned out to be too much for enough young men to violently revolt against the Hojaist apparatus that had been repressing them for decades. In Romania, the 1989 revolution started with an indignation over a petty administrative decision to move a priest from a big city to a smaller city. We interviewed on this channel a specialist in that, so please check that one out. But the point here is that it all started over something absolutely minor compared to the starvation, deprivation and repression that was going on under Ceausescu. In Bulgaria, change came after the regime dispersed a small environmentalist demonstration which would have led nowhere anyway if it had been left alone. In Kazakhstan, after decades of gulag, the ethnic Kazakh population being forcibly turned into a minority in its own country, more arrests, more repression, untold deaths from collectivization, the people have had enough of this only when Gorbachev appointed a foreigner as the head of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Kazakhstan, or formally the first secretary of the Communist Party of Kazakhstan. This guy, Dimuhamed Ahmetuli Kunaev, Dimash for the friends, had been running SSR Kazakhstan for over 20 years. He was almost 75 in 1986 and wanted to retire. He was an ethnic Kazakh and had been living in Kazakhstan for most of his life. In his place, Moscow sent this guy, Gennady Vasilievich Kolbin, a Russian man from Middle Russia who had never been to Kazakhstan before. There's a controversy surrounding the appointment uh, to this day. Gorbachev wrote uh, in his memoirs that the old guy insisted that Moscow appoint someone from outside in order to prevent uh, the ascendance to power of Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, a character about which we will discuss quite a bit in this video. Dimash Kunaev, on the other hand, doesn't mention this aspect in his memoirs. Mr. Kunaev died in 1993 and Gorbachev died in 2022. In fact, I was unironically in Kazakhstan when the news broke out that Gorbachev died. So, since both of the men are dead, we'll just cover all the views. Here in Kazakhstan, the death of Gorbachev was received with a shrug. Unlike East Germany or other places in the communist world, uh, Gorbachev was regarded here more like a source of problems rather than a source of hope. So with this decision of Gorbachev to appoint a Russian to run Kazakhstan, the Zheltoksan began. Zheltoksan is the short for Zheltoksan uh, Kötelis or the December Uprising. About the independence of Kazakhstan, post-communism under Dr. Sultan Nazarbayev and the current Tokayev regime and the fundamental transformations of the country in contemporaneity, this is what we're going to talk in this final episode about Kazakhstan. Let's explore.
Hello everyone and welcome to the fifth installment of the Central Asia featured series. So, in the previous episode we left the story somewhat in a limbo, glossed over the independence moment in order to make a point about how present-day Kazakhstan thinks about the Gulag experiment, since the previous episode was mostly about that. In this episode we'll go through more or less the last 40 years in Kazakhstan spending more time on the 1980s and the present day because they are quite frankly more interesting than the Nazarbayev period. Okay, so as I was mentioning in the previous episode that the Soviet Union conducted multiple nuclear bomb tests on the territory of Kazakhstan, particularly during the rule of Leonid Brezhnev. This led to a lot of tension, particularly after an EMP hit the city of Karaganda and other less known or mentioned villages starting seeing uh, their people dying of unheard of diseases, very likely as a result of radiation poisoning. To placate some of that tension, the Brezhnev administration, through the Dimash Kunaev local administration, invested a lot in the modernization of agriculture. Kazakhstan already had an agricultural background and its pasture lands could turn Kazakhstan into a major grain producing republic for the USSR itself. In international historiography, the Brezhnev period is characterized by political stability but economic stagnation or even decline, and this is true for most of the USSR but not for Kazakhstan. Here, Moscow rerouted a lot of money both through its nuclear project and also for the expansion of agriculture. The idea was to both placate the tension with regards to the hundreds of nuclear tests conducted here, but also to prevent more episodes of famine. But then Brezhnev died and the turmoil started. Between 1982 and 1985, the USSR burned through four presidents. Brezhnev, Yuri Andropov, Konstantin Chernenko and finally Mikhail Gorbachev. In the meantime, the KGB had been ramping up the anti-nuclear propaganda abroad, especially in West Germany. While the USSR did not invent the anti-nuclear movement, it sure did amplify it a lot in order to preserve the energy contracts and also to maintain a perceived balance. And if that sounds familiar, it's because the Russian problem never changes. Well, somehow, the youth in Kazakhstan found out about that and about other things, such as people dying randomly of unknown diseases several years after a nuclear bomb blew out nearby those people's place of residence. By 1984, anti-nuclear narratives were the norm among the youth, and seeing the instability at Moscow, with presidents dying and being replaced basically once a year, and noticing that the first secretary of Kazakhstan is also kinda old, the hope that things can be changed only grew larger. In a move uh, <clears> of <throat> full irony, the anti-nuclear movement became official in 1989 under the name Nevada Semipalatinsk, called as such in solidarity with the mostly Soviet-funded anti-nuclear movements in the West, specifically the United States movement that was aiming to close the Nevada test site, while their own was aiming to close the Semipalatinsk site. People today think of the 1980s in the Soviet Union uh, that one was disconnected from the rest of the world, but that wasn't exactly true. Just like today, the youth in particular had a knack for finding information, even though, just like today, it was routinely wrong, misleading or panic art propaganda. But that's a story for another day. So, on this background, with four presidents in three years in Moscow and with the first secretary of Kazakhstan retiring, Moscow decides in December 1986 to appoint this chap, Gennady Vasilievich Kolbin. A highly trusted apparatchik from Moscow, so much so that he was entrusted to decide himself where to open branches of the Moscow State University and had been the deputy of the Supreme Soviet of the Soviet Union from 1979 and he was going to serve in that role until 1989. Just one problem, he didn't speak Kazakh, he had never lived or worked in Kazakhstan and really had no connection whatsoever either with the country or with the Communist Party of Kazakhstan. Now, there's an entire controversy here with the appointment of Kolbin. His predecessor, Dimuhamed Kunaev, said that Kolbin was simply rammed through by Gorbachev, who assured him that a trusted comrade will be sent to take his place after retirement. Gorbachev, on the other hand, initially claimed that veteran Kunaev asked him to appoint a foreigner in order to prevent the rise 
to power of Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. Later on, in 2006, Kazakh journalist and successful businessman Arman Jean Baitasov, whom I hope will not copyright strike me for quoting his segment, asked Gorbachev again about these things and the former Soviet leader had a slightly different story. Here, take a look. Хотя позже Горбачев стал лукавить и утверждал, что все было по-другому. Настолько у нас были отношения с ним нормальные, хорошие, доверительные. Я его спрашиваю, а кого же рекомендовать? Он говорит, ну там в Казахстане некого. И я, вообще говоря, доверился ему, откровенно говоря. И говорит, вообще там такая это все. Надо завести со стороны русского человека поставить. Вскоре Кунаев вручил Горбачеву заявление с просьбой об уходе на пенсию. Тот заявление принял. Сказал, что поддерживает просьбу и вынесет вопрос на рассмотрение Политбюро. 11 декабря 1986 года состоялось заседание Политбюро. Оно проходило уже без участия Кунаева. Было принято решение о его освобождении от занимаемой должности в связи с уходом на пенсию. А уже 16 декабря состоялся пленум ЦК Компартии Казахской ССР. Никто из казахстанцев, вплоть до верхнего эшелона власти, даже не предполагал, какую замену Кунаеву нашел Горбачев. Очевидно, Центр считал, что республики по-прежнему остаются его вотчиной, и можно, не советуя с ни с кем, назначать и менять там руководителей по собственному усмотрению. Вот как вспоминает об этом Нурсултан Назарбаев. Только 15 декабря, за день до назначенного организационного пленума, у трапа прилетевшего из Москвы самолета мы узнали, что на этот пост рекомендуется Геннадий Колбин. Такой подход к важнейшей проблеме, по сути, к будущей судьбе Казахстана просто ошеломил членов бюро ЦК Компартии Республики. В такой же завороженной обстановке прошел и пленум ЦК. Все подняли руки и первым секретарем стал Колбин. Вновь восторжествовал синдром бездумного послушания центру, синдром казарменной психологии. Никто не задумался о последствиях, а они не заставили себя ждать. Конец цитаты. Позже в адрес Кунаева не раз звучали упреки, что он не попытался урезонить молодежь. Но, как пишет сам бывший глава республики, ему этого сделать не дали. Now, of course, Nazarbayev had his version published when he was in power, so take that with a grain of salt, too. There's also the fact that Kunaev had been under several corruption investigations for which he'd been house arrest for a while in 1986 and 1987. And then there's also the angle that he had been holding a grudge against Nusultan Nazarbayev because the latter had gotten Kunaev's brother, Askar Kunaev, dismissed from his position as president of the Academy of Sciences, also under accusations of corruption and dereliction of duty. Anyway, regardless of how the political Game of Thrones played out, the appointment of Tavarshchi Gennady Vasilievich Kolbin as the first secretary of the Communist Party of Kazakhstan turned out to be the catalyst to bring all of the dissidents together. The party already knew it had a youth problem, and the student movements were already waiting for a moment. But in that December 1986, they found allies. Regular people, older intellectuals, even some university professors seen as close to the regime otherwise, they slowly started going out to the protest in the afternoon of December 17, 1986. Colbin hadn't been a single day in power and was already facing protests. By that time, it was already known among the apparatchiks that the whole USSR is boiling and that the system itself may not survive. So, naturally, this outpouring of people on the streets created a panic at the Central Committee. The current leader, the former leader, and Nazarbayev got talking. Here's the first two recounting that day. Из кабинета Камалидену. И сказали, мы видим, собирается народ на площади. Было бы хорошо вам выступить перед молодежью. Он отказался. Значит, он сидел вот так вот рядом с перпендикулярным столом напротив товарища Назарбаева Камалиденова, суть вместе со всеми членами бюро. И когда он зашел в кабинет, первое, что он произнес, что он сказал, это ваша Назарбаева и Камалиденова проделки. Это вы заварили все. Отказался он выступить перед членами бюро, и мы тогда условились, что выступят с трибуны все члены бюро казахской национальности, что и было сделано. 
Я собрался с разной и поехал в ЦК. С намерением выступить перед молодежью. Пришел, зашел в кабинет Колбина. Там некоторые члены бюро ЦК были. Решали вопрос, как делать, какие меры принять, что надо объяснить молодежи. И никаких указаний, советов, предложений о моем выступлении речь не шла. После этого был объявлен небольшой перерыв, переговоры пошли с Москвой. Мы, чтобы не мешать переговорам Миро... Колбина с Москвой, а там у них кабинет оставался Мирошкин, мы вышли из кабинета, и через 10-15 минут нас обратно собрали, и Колбин, обращаясь, мне сказал, мы сами примем надлежащие меры, отдыхайте, Дима Шахмедович. Это было на второй день событий. Это было 8 декабря? Да. Позвонил ему и сказал, что он будет нести полную ответственность, если не определит мер, не примет мер, значит, по наведению порядка и все поставить на место. Да, да, откуда вам это известно? Мне Михаил Сергеевич об этом говорил. Он мне звонил сначала, просил, Михаил Сергеевич Бачев, звонил и говорит, я хочу переговорить. Я сказал, что, наверное, не надо. Значит, а потом второй раз он мне позвонил, я все-таки позвонил и переговорил. После этого разговора через два часа демонстрация мирно разошлась. И это очередная неверная, неправильная информация. Горбачев мне позвонил около часа дня 17 декабря, когда я уже возвратился из ЦК. Он мне спросил, чем объяснить такой выход молодежи. Я говорю, вот сейчас ЦК собрались, сберу ЦК заседать, они вам скажут. В этих делах я никакого участия не поднимал. Он сказал, хорошо, мы разберемся. И трубку положил. Сказал, мы меры примем, наведем порядок. Я считаю, что очень плохо. И что делает намек на какое-то организованное начало, это одновременно проведение в ряде городов каких-то явлений. Anyway, one thing led to another and the story went as usual. The official dom spread rumors that the protesters are in fact a gathering of junkies and paid shills. Unfortunately, someone did record this video, albeit surreptitiously, and disseminated it quickly that day. As you can see in the video, there are no junkies to be found, just regular people. The Soviet state news agency, TASS, in a gesture unseen till then, reported about the protests, although in the usual tone. This is how TASS framed the protests on December the 18th, 1986. Quote, a group of students incited by nationalistic elements last evening and today took to the streets of Almaty, expressing disapproval of the decisions of the recent plenary meeting. Hooligans, parasites and other anti-social persons made use of this situation and resorted to unlawful actions against representatives of law and order. They set fire to a food store and to private cars and insulted the townspeople." Unquote. The report was extraordinary not because of its language, but also because it was the first time the Soviet Union acknowledged in public that such thing as protests against the regime actually happen. Around the same period, other protests were occurring in Lithuania, Estonia, Georgia or Uzbekistan. Those were never mentioned, but this one in particular was. To make things worse, on the second day the protests uh, spread. Uh, Shymkent, Pavlodar, Talde Kurgan and Karaganda also saw protests. Moreover, by the second day in the evening, the protests turned into a full riot. I tried to select the footage I'm showing here in order to avoid having the video put under an age verification flag, but put simply, it was brutal. The Central Committee ordered troops from the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the Druzhniki, the Cadets, the Militia and the KGB to cordon the square and videotape the participants. The situation escalated around uh, when it got dark, which in December means about 4 p.m. When dark set in, the troops were ordered to disperse the protesters. This led to clashes between the security forces and the demonstrators, which continued throughout the night, both in the Brezhnev Square, which is today the Republican Square, and in different parts of Almaty. 
Later that day, protests turned into civil unrest and the clashes extended not just to the streets, but also inside the universities and dormitories between the troops and militia units and Kazakh students on the other side. It was, for all intents and purposes, a wide-scale armed confrontation. The regime won, though it took another day for that to happen. The regime claimed between 200 and 3,000 people attended the riots though that's obviously a lie because at least 5,000 people were arrested and jailed. And they obviously didn't jail everybody, so more realistically at least 30,000 people attended. Nobody knows, however, how many people died in this three-day riot. Best guesses say that at least 200 people either died in the riot or were summarily executed soon afterwards. Hundreds more were sent to hard labor camps or to regular prisons, but not before they were heavily beaten several dozens of times. Kunayush Rahmetov, who participated in the riot and uh, at the time was a leader in the communist youth organization, the Komsomol, told Radio Free Europe 20 years later that, quote, I had asked two friends to make a banner that said long live Lenin's policies on nationalities, Kazakhstan should stick to its constitution. For this slogan, we were arrested on December the 22nd. On January the 8th, the Supreme Court sentenced me. It was very unusual. The trial lasted only two days, and even though it was announced as an open trial, there was nobody in the court except us. We were sentenced to seven years in prison." Unquote. Adilhan Ulu, another participant, said, quote, We were brought to the detention center on Tashkent Street here in Almata and forced to sit on the snow for two and a half hours. We were beaten severely. The worst thing that happened to us was when we were put in a, in a jail cell. My hands and nose were broken and the beatings were constant. I later on tried to get admitted to the university, but the application papers were returned. They would only hire me to do menial labor. One gets the feeling of being under surveillance. There were no prospects for the future. I always wanted to be a journalist or a writer. All my dreams were buried with Zheltok San. My son now asks me, Father, you have chosen to suffer. What for? Unquote. This latter question will become uh, relevant again in 2022, but until we get there, it should be noted that the local Communist Party tried really, really hard to bury the very existence of the protest. Even mentioning in public Zheltok San, as the protests ended up being known, could land one into some trouble. By 1989, discontent had been growing as Colbin's grip on power was weakening, not least because of the repression of the 1986 protest. To make things worse, multiple writers from Kazakhstan started going around in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan and talking about what had happened. That prompted a decorated Soviet Kyrgyz soldier, who had been, among others, decorated for repressing the manifestations in Almaty, to officially turn back all his honors and ask the Central Soviet authorities authorities to investigate what had happened. This was almost three years later, and also spelled the end of Kolbin's stint as first secretary of Kazakhstan. Gorbachev recalled him to Moscow in June 1989 and placed him on some role that nobody cared about from where he would retire a year later, before the USSR itself ceased to exist. From Zheltoksan, at least four movements were born. The Nevada Semipalatinsk movement, aiming to shut down the Semipalatinsk nuclear testing site that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> the Alash National Freedom Party, which proposed a Turkic Islamic future for Kazakhstan. The Azat Republican Party, which proposed a national conservative republic grounded in a modern constitution. And the Zheltoksan National Democratic Party, which wanted, to release, uh, which wanted the release of the remaining prisoners from the 86 riots and the multi-party parliamentary system in the country. None of these movements were registered political parties or NGOs, and all four of them slowly but surely fizzled out by 2002, either because they achieved their objective, the semi-Palatinsk nuclear testing site was shut down and the prisoners were released, or because, after independence, enough people stopped caring about their objectives. It also didn't help that what followed after Kolbin was a regime also prone to gobbling up people to serve the new regime. So who replaced uh, Kolbin? Well, this man, Nur Sultan Abishul Nazarbayev. 
the last first secretary of the Communist Party of Kazakh SSR and the first elected president of the nation even before achieving independence. He was to become one of the longest ruling non-royal leaders in the world and one of the first leaders in contemporary history to build what I like to call a dictatorship with a huge smiley face. Now, of course, calling Nazarbayev's regime a dictatorship with a smiley face pisses off everybody. Nazarbayev didn't see himself as a dictator and those who crossed him surely didn't exactly see a smiley face. Nevertheless, this is the most appropriate description for the vast majority of the people. Under Nazarbayev, the senseless killing stopped and the repression changed to more subtle ways. A guy with great acumen for power, Nazarbayev more or less went on to rule Kazakhstan unopposed for 30 years. His entire career is about making decisions that enhance his personal power. And his luck lasted for exactly 50 years, from 1972, when he was appointed secretary of the Communist Party Committee of the Karaganda Metallurgical Combinat, and all the way till 2022, when he lost everything. already mentioned earlier in this video about the machinations he pulled uh, in the 1980s, but I didn't mention that he was effectively the Prime Minister of Kazakhstan since 1984. <clears throat> By 1990, he was the President. Sensing that the USSR would fall, he supported Russian President Boris Yeltsin against the attempted coup in August 1991 by Soviet hardliners. He also turned down the offer to be the Vice President of the whole of Soviet Union as he correctly calculated that his future in terms of personal power lies in him ruling unopposed in Kazakhstan. 
His interests then aligned with the public, so on the first open presidential elections he got 95% of the vote. Then he quickly moved on diplomacy. I was mentioning in the last episode that the post-Soviet structure called the Commonwealth of Independent States was in fact created in Almaty with Nur Sultan Nazarbayev's signature. In 1990s, Nazarbayev tried all the ideas floating around to see what works to keep him in power. He released the political prisoners, officially declared them victims of Soviet repression, dissolved the Supreme Soviet, oversaw the adoption of a constitution that gave him power, of course, yet still backed down in face of serious protests, like, for instance, in 1994, when he accepted to fire Prime Minister Sergei Tereshchenko, a deeply unpopular ethnic Russian but close friend of Nazarbayev, and so on and so forth. By 1995, he was dissolving the legislature just before they could vote on a schedule for presidential elections. To legitimize uh, the move, later on a referendum was held so he can run for office again. More or less, he pulled the Putin multiple times. The term of, of the president was extended to seven years, and when that became inconvenient, the constitution was amended again. In 1999, the Prime Minister, Nurlan Balgimbaev, gets embroiled into a scandal involving an arms deal with North Korea, and the economy was, just like everywhere else in the post-communist world, far from being in a great shape. So Nazarbayev takes advantage to seem like he's listening to the people and fires Mr. Nurlan and appoints in his place a very familiar figure nowadays, Mr. Kasim Jomat Tokayev. Ironically, exactly 20 years later, Tokayev would do to him what he had done to the Soviet apparatchik in the 1980s. By 2007, Nazarbayev's party, now known as OTAN, won all of the contested seats in the parliament, which raised eyebrows everywhere, including, ironically, in Russia. In response, an amendment was introduced to allow for a two-party system wherein any party that wins second place in the race, regardless or not if it passes the 7% electoral threshold, would be guaranteed to have representation in the parliament. But Nazarbayev was most skillful in diplomacy. He was able to avoid loud Western criticism while at the same time attracting Western investment. How did he do that? Well, like all other dictators, he would invite key influencers into the country on a tour. Since most Westerners don't speak Russian, they had limited ways of double-checking Nazarbayev's claims. Take, for instance, Jonathan Aitken, British Tory, author, Church of England priest and former minister for defense in the United Kingdom, a credible voice in Western circles in the 2000s. Mr. Aitken released in 2009 a biography of Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. Unsurprisingly, the book credits Nazarbayev with all of the successes of modern Kazakhstan and glosses over the, what do you call it, democratic deficit, I guess? <laughs> By December 2011, though, protests against the rule of Nazarbayev became a common feature of the country. So were the mass arrests. Less brutal than in 1986, but old habits die hard. From 2011 till 2022, there were at least 50 big protests and hundreds of smaller ones, each and every one of them described by the Western media as rare protests. Sure, we can speculate as to why did the Western media downplay the popular anger, but quite frankly, stupidity and ignorance can explain most of it. After all, Nazarbayev continued his diplomatic efforts. The coveted internationally recognized exhibition on energy, Expo 2017, took place in Astana, drawing in millions of visitors and with them jobs, visibility and investment. Oh yeah, the capital was moved to Astana from Almaty in 1997, thus making Kazakhstan the country with the second coldest capital city in the world. Nevertheless, most of the constructions from uh, Expo 2017 ended up being abandoned, which led to more unrest over perceived governmental waste and corruption, so by 2018, Kasem Tokayev was openly speculating on the BBC and in English that Nazarbayev will not run for a sixth term in 2020, when the next elections were due. And lo and behold, in March 2019, yet another round of protests erupted. This time, the Western media called them the unusually persistent protests. 
I can't help but notice the consistency of the Western media in downplaying these events in an otherwise strategically important country. Anyway. Shalket or leave old man, the slogan filling in the streets of Kazakh cities, particularly Almaty, from 2010 to 2022. Nazarbayev had successfully pushed for a parliamentary bill granting him legal immunity as well as other policies designed to legalize money laundering. When Kazakh opposition newspaper Respublika reported in 2002 that Nazarbayev had in the mid-1990s secretly stashed away $1 billion of state oil revenue in Swiss bank accounts, the decapitated carcass of a dog was left outside the newspaper's offices, with a warning reading there won't be a next time. The dog's head later turned up again outside editor Irina Petrushova's apartment, with a similar warning. The newspaper was then firebombed, multiple times. By 2019, it was an open secret that the Nazarbayev clan is filthy rich as a result of exploiting the natural resources of the country. In fairness, this is the case too in Tajikistan, but unlike Tajikistan, the Kazakh people pursued a more capitalistic behavior, which in time led to a more educated, wealthier and courageous population. Nobody would protest like this in Tajikistan, that's for sure. Long story short, the protests refused to die in 2019, so suddenly Nazarbayev resigns, though with some twists. Соратники, сегодня я обращаюсь к вам, как это делал всегда в самые важные моменты истории нашего государства, которые мы вместе строим. Но сегодняшнее обращение мое особое. Я принял непростое для себя решение сложить с себя полномочия президента Республики Казахстан. Я наделен статусом первого президента Эльбаса, лидера нации. Остаюсь председателем Совета Безопасности, который законами наделен серьезными полномочиями определения внутренней и внешней политики страны. Остаюсь председателем партии Нарутан, членом Конституционного Совета. And this is how we get to contemporary times, the most exciting and my favorite period of all Kazakh history. Following the resignation of Nazarbayev, acting president became Kasim Tokayev, but the founder of the nation still retained a lot of influence. The Security Council that he mentioned in his resignation speech was in fact a constitutional body which had Nazarbayev as president for life. So, in other words, Tokayev still had to play nice, just like Nazarbayev had to play nice in 1986. So he did. Among the first things as president was to rename the capital city from Astana to Dur Sultan in the honor of the predecessor and the founder of the nation. The move lasted for three years. The current capital city is accustomed to have its name changed every time the political winds change. The city is not even 200 years old and has borne five names already. Akmolinsk, Tselinograd, Akmola, Nur Sultan and Astana. Thus making the city the holder of the Guinness World Record for the capital city with the most name changes in modern times. The fact that the old man left but didn't really leave was noticed by the populace, so by June 2019 the streets filled up again with protesters, especially since Tokayev announced snap presidential elections, which would effectively be a formality since there was no time for others to mount a serious campaign. Nevertheless, the elections were held, Tokayev won and announced a longer program to strengthen the civil society. But other than that, he laid low, even as president. While quite vocal on day-to-day -day issues, such as an explosion at a military ammo warehouse, a plane crash or some old criminal case where a parole was under discussion, newly elected President Tokayev avoided the most important themes throughout 2019 and early 2020. He even accepted that all but three cabinet positions be filled only with the approval of Nazarbayev. But then he became a bit more courageous. On May 2, 2020, Tokayev removes Nazarbayev's daughter, Daiga Nazarbayeva, from the Senate and her role as the chair. 
Then in December 2020, the first real press investigation into the corruption of the Nazarbayev clan, without fear of retribution, finally drops. The investigative report was conducted by Radio Free Europe slash Radio Liberty, and it identified at least $785 million in European and American real estate purchases made by the Nazarbayev family members and their in-laws in six countries over a 20-year span. This figure includes a handful of properties that have since been sold, including multi-million dollar apartments in the United States bought by Nazarbayev's brother, Bolat. The figure, however, did not include a sprawling Spanish estate owned by Kulibayev for which a purchase price could not be found. By the 2021 legislative elections, the influence of the Nazarbayev clan was under serious threat and the elections, perhaps for the first time, saw Nazarbayev's party losing seats, especially in constituencies where people seen as too close to the old man were running. By the end of 2021, the old man was compelled to transfer control over the ruling party to Tokayev. All of this was regarded with disgust by the populace, who didn't believe the conflict between Tokayev and the old man was real. And to be fair, the people had a point. Tokayev had been in Nazarbayev's circles since forever, and although a much more presentable chap in international setting, he was still, after all, a product of the same political class. And just like I was saying at the beginning of this video, regimes sometimes fall or are forced to reform as a result of public unrest that starts from something stupid or marginal. In 1986, it was a change by Gorbachev. In uh, January 2022, it was a marginal increase in the price of liquefied petroleum gas. Now, do keep in mind that the tenge, the local currency, has been inflationary for quite some time following the low prices for fossil fuels throughout the previous decade, but also following corruption and wasteful spending during the last two terms of the old man. To give you an idea, the price increased from 70 cents a gallon to $1 a gallon. By comparison, in the United States, consumer LPGs sold at $2.75 a gallon at the moment of this recording. In my backyard, it is sold at $3.37 a gallon. Nevertheless, enough people in Kazakhstan thought that enough is enough. So once again, we heard that slogan. <laughs> Except this time it was far more serious. It resembled more like 1986 rather than 1994, 2001, 2004, 2011, 2016 or 2019. What started on January the 2nd, 2022, as a strike in Zhanao Zen, a city which had a history of violent strikes due to energy policy, this time quickly spread to the whole country and made a number on Almaty. By January the 3rd, the city of uh, Zhanaozen was blocked with as many as 10,000 people on the streets. By the evening of January the 4th, the police and the protesters were sparring on the streets of Almaty. By January the 5th, the situation was spiraling out of control. Tokayev, however, kept his eyes on the prize. With the security situation deteriorating, he declared a state of emergency, removed Nur Sultan Nazarbayev from the Security Council, and also removed the ministers who had been put in the cabinet by Nazarbayev. Meanwhile, government buildings in Almaty, Shemkent, Aktobe, and Taraz were being assaulted and sometimes occupied by the protesters. To make things worse, the Almaty airport also got thrashed, thus messing around with the vital international transport on which the regime relies on for revenue. In places where Nazarbayev had managed to erect statues of himself, yeah, those were taken down too. By January the 6th, literally Russian troops were brought into the country. Well, officially they were CSTO troops, but you get the point. One police officer was found beheaded, at least 12 police officers had been killed and several dozens of protesters before the, uh, had been killed before the arrival of the Russian troops. And of course, the Russian troops did what you would expect them to do, which is to significantly increase the number of casualties. Here's how the report from Radio Free Europe sounded in the evening of January the 6th, 2022. 
Стрельба и взрывы на улицах Алматы. Участники протеста вооружаются и противостоят военным и полиции. Те применяют оружие. МВД Казахстана заявляет о двух тысячах задержанных в Алматы. Агентство «Рейтерс» пишет, что 6 января утром несколько бронетранспортеров и десятки военных вошли на главную площадь города, где находились протестующие, после чего началась стрельба. Очевидцы утверждают, что военные стреляли по толпе. Сообщается, что ночью протестующие штурмовали административные здания и силовики приступили к крупнейшей антитеррористической спецоперации в городе. Об этом власти уведомили жителей. Оставайтесь в безопасных местах, было сказано в сообщении от полиции. Ранее демонстранты подожгли президентскую резиденцию. Против участников протеста полицейские применяют также водометы, слезоточивый газ и светошумовые гранаты. Полиция Казахстана заявляет об убийстве десятков участников протестов. Есть информация и о погибших военных и полицейских. Бедняга. Известно как минимум о 13 жертвах, хотя данные о количестве расходятся. Минздрав Казахстана сообщил, что по всей стране в результате беспорядков пострадали тысячи людей. Из них 400 госпитализированы, 62 человека в реанимации. Старик, уходи, скандируют протестующие. Это стало одним из главных призывов этих дней к Назарбаеву, который ранее был смещен с поста главы Совета безопасности. Один из протестующих обратился напрямую к журналистам. Вы должны понять, что здесь произошло. Сжатая пружина была спущена впервые за 30 лет. Послушайте, по всем нам стреляли. Все мы прошли через это, но никто из нас не хочет убивать или оказывать давление на другого человека. Пожалуйста, приходите сюда и убедитесь в этом собственными глазами. Мы показываем вам лицо новой страны, и вы должны стать свидетелем этого. Изначально люди вышли на улицы из-за повышения цены на сжиженный газ. Но позже демонстранты стали выдвигать политические требования. Мы выступаем против этого правительства. Все дорожает, весь народ поднялся, народ нищенствует. Поэтому мы здесь. Пусть нас услышат. Вчера я лишился своего братишки. Он попал под колеса одной из военных машин. Хотя мы вышли на мирный митинг, а в нас начали кидать шумовые гранаты, дымовые шашки. Уважаемый Касым Жомар Токаев, мне 30 лет. Я не хочу еще 30 лет быть рабом. А это международный аэропорт Алматы после захвата. Разграблены банкоматы и магазины Duty Free. Сотни людей не смогли вылететь. Все рейсы отменены. Разграблено и оружейное Алматинского управления Комитета нацбезопасности. Также в сети появляется множество видео, как мародеры грабят банки, магазины и торговые центры. При этом до конца не ясно, имеют ли отношение эти вооруженные люди к участникам протестов. Президент Казахстана запросил силовой помощи для борьбы с протестами у страну ДКБ, организации договора о коллективной безопасности. Общую сумму ущерба после массовых беспорядков в Казахстане на 6 января оценивают приблизительно... Boy, doesn't that sound familiar. Nevertheless, Tokayev relented and introduced a price cap on LPG and promised an antitrust investigation into possible price fixing. He also promised more openness from the administration, a new constitution, and pointed out that the old man is finally out. Essentially, all that had been demanded in the streets was either done or was soon to be done, from Tokayev's point of view. Except it was a bit more complicated than that, of course. For starters, you don't take down the Nazarbayev apparatus with the stroke of a pen. The old man ruled for 30 years. He has his people in all institutions, and his clan continues to control most of the important parts of the economy. Nevertheless, Tokayev promised to try. So, through 2022, the constitution was amended to further limit the powers of the president and limit the president's terms to one seven-year term. And then he triggered snap elections for president. As I was saying in episode two, he got 81% of the vote, and number two was the option against everyone, with almost 6% of the vote. But at what cost? 10,000 people were arrested in connection to what is now referred to as Bloody January or the January Tragedy. 
227 people died during these events, which, while not shrouded in secrecy like the ones in 1986, are still comparable as a scale. So much so that in December 2022, the, a new memorial was erected to the victims of these events, locally referred to as Can de Cantar. And, in a way, they were also about independence, and also from Russia. A month after the conclusion of the January tragedy, Russia invaded Ukraine, and that settled the issue here. Kazakhstan is to move away from Russia. But again, it's not that simple. Nazarbayev tied Kazakhstan's economic interests to Russia's through the Eurasian Economic Union, through CSTO, and through a plethora of personal but economically relevant deals and understandings. In what seemed unimaginable in December 2021, by June 2022 it was reality. The president refused to accept an order of merit from Putin, condemned the invasion, refused to even consider any discussion about recognizing the Russian puppet states of Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic, adopted the Western sanctions on Russia, used the public's discontent to open up more schools in the Kazakh language, announced more money for culture to be produced in Kazakh, including and especially children's content, but also translations of foreign movies into Kazakh by default rather than Russian, and also announced that it will host anyone who flees Putin's mobilization. For all intents and purposes, the geopolitics of Kazakhstan changed fundamentally from bloody January to present day. The pivot towards China and the Evropejski Soyuz is perhaps not entirely visible yet, but the pivot explicitly away from Russia is very visible. So much so that the Russian ambassador to Kazakhstan, Alexei Borodavkin, effectively started threatening the country with war. To which I will leave the reply by Arman Shuraev, which speaks for itself. Друзья, сегодня мне мое безупречное знание русского языка позволит дать ответ этому идиоту, послу Российской Федерации в Казахстане, некто Бородавкину, заявил о том, что в Казахстане живут нацисты, националисты. Если надо будет, то мы там проведем специальную военную операцию. Слушай, проводилка у тебя сломалась, Бородавкин, и у твоего патрона Путина. Вы уже девятый месяц получаете звездюлей от доблестных украинцев. И я могу сказать, не дай бог, вы еще решите зайти к нам за легкой победой. Легкой победы у вас не будет. Вся казахстанская степь будет усыпана трупами ваших мобиков. Так вот, я могу сказать, когда ты говоришь о русофобии в Казахстане, то я хочу сказать, что в первую очередь эту русофобию сеете вы, такие как ты, Бородавкин. Такие, как эти Никоновы, Федоровы и всякие Соловьевы и Медведевы, которые чуть ли не каждый день с вашего пропагандона заявляют о том, что город Алмату нужно разбомбить атомной бомбой, что нужно захватить северные и восточные области Казахстана и присоединить к России, что нужно запретить казахский язык в Казахстане. Русофобия – это все, чего вы добились своими дебильными Действиями. Вы что, думаете, что это украинцы просто так начали стрелять вас? Это вы ворвались в чужой дом с огнем и мечом. И теперь получаете ответку. И то же самое будет, если вы зайдете к нам, если вы зайдете к нашим соседям. Вы идиоты, вы людоеды, которые поедаете, и самоеды, которые съедаете сами себя. Я очень радуюсь, я надеюсь, что... Эта ваша гнилая федерация распадется в ближайшем будущем. Бородавкин, если ты хочешь увидеть нацистов и фашистов в Казахстане, посмотри в зеркало, и ты увидишь самого главного фашиста и нациста. Слава Украине! Алга Казахстан! Keep in mind that this man was himself on the wrong side of the regime multiple times, which is why he is a very influential figure in Kazakh civil society. Now, as I was saying, it's a bit more complicated than that. The government has been closing loopholes left and right throughout 2022 to prevent work around uh, the sanctions on Russia, but new ones are being found all the time. 
the issue of so-called parallel imports just won't go away. And that's not because the black market always finds a way, but also because the whole country has been purposefully integrated with Russia, including at infrastructure level between 1936 and really until 2019. Untangling all of that will require a lot of political will, a lot of money, and a lot of patience. And while political will and money can be found through Kazakhstan's newer partners, the issue of patience is harder, so there's that. As the protesters have been saying a year ago, nobody's got time anymore. Yet that's exactly what Tokayev is asking. Time. And it cannot uh, be stressed enough just how profound these changes are. In 2019, Takayev said in Germany that he doesn't get what's all this fuss with Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. In 2023, a politician loses everything for being pro-Russian in public. Here's from January the 20th, 2023. <laughs> Спецоперация <coughs> Ukraina <gülüyor> Ақжол партиясы өзін алашын ұзбасарымыз дейді ғой. Бірақ сіздің бір әріптесіңіз Азамат Абдилаев кеше азатыққа сұқпат бергенде Ресейдің Украинаға басқыншылығын арнай операция деп айт, атап, Ресей президентін және Ресейді қолдайтын айтты. Сіз содан хабарыңыз бар ма және дұрысты бөресіз ба? Мұны естеген жоқпын. Енді барбаса бұл оның өзінің жеке пікірі. Ал партиямыздың пікірі біз ұлтшыл партия ретінде ең алдымен өзіміздің тәуелсіздігімізді, өзіміздің жер тұтасығымызды сақтауымыз керек деп білеміз. Партияның позициясы бұнда емес, е? Жоқ, жоқ. Соғысты қолдамайсыздар ма? Жоқ, жоқ. Украин жақты соғыс үшген балақты жақсы білемін. Көп адамдарды білемін. Уже енді Украин now this wasn't conceivable a year ago. Playing nice with Muscovy was the default with almost all political class until three minutes ago, historically speaking. Heck, by the time I publish this video, it's likely that yet another fundamental change comes out. At this pace of change, it's not out of question to see a sudden exit from CSTO or something like that. Ultimately, it is impossible to predict where Kazakhstan will land, but for the first time in hundreds of years, there is at least a theoretical possibility that the destination will be at least partially influenced by the Kazakh people and the decisions be made somewhat independently. Of course, within the confines of reality. Given the geography of Kazakhstan, it can't afford to ignore both Russia and China, but it can ignore Russia, play somewhat nice with China and diversify partners both uh, westwards towards Europe and eastwards towards Japan and South Korea. And so far, this does seem to be the direction. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't want this to be perceived as me singing the praises of Mr. Tokayev. After all, he ruthlessly used the very real and legitimate popular grievances to consolidate his power, and then lied about it twice, first blaming it on foreign terrorists, kind of like Ceausescu, and then by saying that others were using the popular grievances to take him out. But for better or worse, at least Kazakhstan is getting some good policy out of it too. And please don't forget the context. By Central Asia standards, Tokayev is perhaps the least bad, which probably explains why he is more popular outside of Kazakhstan. 
Almost every Uzbek I spoke with while in Uzbekistan told me they'd prefer to have Tokayev, even if only because he actually limited his own power. Now think about that, how rare it is for a politician to purposefully limit his own power. With that said, even if we do presume best intentions, which we really shouldn't, the fact remains that there's a long and painful road ahead of Kazakhstan. Between improving the industry, diversifying the economy, fix the environmental damage inherited from the Soviet Union, increase political pluralism, and all while pursuing a quasi-independent foreign policy, yeah, that's a lot of work. Probably some of the goals will have to be moderated. And all of that while the Russian propaganda continues to roast the current administration for both real and imaginary things. Because of course they will. That's really all I had to say about Kazakhstan. The next three episodes will be about the southeastern neighbor, Uzbekistan, with the next episode going through the civilizational background of the country. Of all the countries of Central Asia, Uzbekistan has the longest history and the biggest population, and for centuries Uzbek cities were centers of civilization in and of themselves, until the Russian problem happened. And then Islam Karimov happened. And now they're also finally yet again in the position to try to get back to being a civilizational center. Will it work? How did all of that happen? Well, that's what we're going to explore slowly and as meticulously as a YouTube video can allow in the next three episodes. So with all of that being said, thank you all for watching. Thank you for your continuous and generous financial support, especially to those who made this series possible. Don't forget to subscribe, visit our website, and uh, if you like what we do, please consider a donation. And with that, I'll see you all soon on The Freedom Alternative.